All right, in our opening remarks on this study, marriage, divorce, and remarriage, we'll make some comments to prepare the listener for the study on these tapes. We realize that the subject we're studying is a subject of somewhat controversy in Christianity for hundreds, and if not thousands, of years, and I realize that uh, tackling this subject in this century is just like picking up a loaded gun or a bomb. However, I feel like we as God's preachers owe it to ourselves to do our homework on such subjects as this, and we also owe it to the people coming into our churches to be able to explain to them exactly what the Bible says on this matter. It has always stirred controversy. I realize that uh, many people will not agree, and some will agree, with the teaching on these tapes, but after 17 years of studying, and praying and fasting for many, many days over a period of time and studying on these things, we feel um, a certain amount of inspiration that we should do these tapes. Now, the divorced people and remarried people feel that the person who is not divorced has no compassion and has a biased opinion against them. The problem is complicated because People who have never been divorced and in one marriage feel like the people who are divorced are biased and are trying to cover up for themselves. And so we have a great controversy here of people's motives determining what they believe. Now, I've been on both sides of this question and by the grace of God haven't changed my opinion or teaching and the way I've always taught it to our church. So I do feel uh, a little bit qualified to speak on this subject. I went through a terrible marriage uh, problems for 10 years in my home. I, it's a very unfortunate situation, to say the least, especially when I have three children that were involved. And uh, I wouldn't wish that on anybody. It's a terrible thing. Um, went through four separations before the final blow came in 1988. And divorce is a terrible thing. It's a terrible thing for the people involved. It's a terrible thing for the community and for the children involved. But by the grace of God, the Lord's been good to me. He's brought us through it. It's a thing that should be avoided at all cost, but when it absolutely is unavoidable, then where does that leave the person who is divorced? That's the content and the subject matter of these study tapes. By the grace of God, the Lord has blessed me I have all three of my kids in my complete custody. I have uh, my home where I'm still pastoring the church. By the grace of God, it's doing wonderful, and people are still being saved. And for that, I thank God. And I ask you, as Paul said in Acts 26, 3, I beseech thee to hear me patiently. Truth doesn't change. I taught the same thing about divorce and remarriage ten years ago nearly in our church as you'll be hearing on these study tapes. I've got notes as far back as 1982 where I taught on the, the subject in our church on Wednesday nights and I haven't had to change. If you teach the truth you don't have to change to suit yourself. If you believe the Bible you do not adjust the Bible to suit your fancies or situation. You adjust your beliefs to fit the Word of God. And that's what we'll try to do by the grace of God in this study. As preachers, we are forced to deal with this issue. And many, many, many years ago, I settled it between me and God what the book said about the subject and tried to fully study the subject and do my homework before I made brash and bold, loud statements that I wasn't able to back up nor prove. Now, we'll use as a, as a thought verse for these studies Proverbs 18:13. He that answereth a matter before he heareth it, it is folly and shame unto him. Many, many preachers have made bold, foolish statements about divorce and remarriage. They're not able to prove, not able to, to back up by Scripture, and because of this have stuck their neck out and got themselves in a terrible mess and realize later they've been wrong and are too ashamed to go back and apologize and realized they made a mistake and therefore got themselves in an awful mess. And by the help of the Lord, we want to try to help many, many young preachers and young people 
deal with this issue. The book said in 2 Timothy 2.15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, in the beginning and, and introduction, notice several things about these studies. And I want you to please take notice of this. The first thing we'll do is we'll take the King James 1611 authorized version text. As far as I'm concerned, that is the final authority to the English-speaking people, and no Greek, no Hebrew, no other translation will contradict what the King James Bible says and overthrow what the King James Bible says in these studies. In other words, it is the final authority in all matters of faith and practice. The second thing you'll notice, we will leave the text alone as it stands. In other words, we're going to read that Bible just exactly like it says, and that way you will, you will know that we're teaching what the Bible says, not what we think. By the help of the Lord, we will not twist a scripture to make it fit what we believe. You don't have to if you believe what the Bible says. We'll never twist the scripture to match our beliefs. We'll always, by the help of the Lord, twist our beliefs to match the scripture. A man should not, never adjust the Bible to his theology. He should always be willing and not too hard-headed to adjust his theology to the Bible. We're not loyal to a denomination or to a church or to a leader on this earth. We'll be loyal to the holy scriptures and say, as one great preacher of old, what saith the scripture? Another thing you'll notice, we will not add words to the text to make it fit what we think. In other words, we're going to let the scriptures say exactly what they are. We'll speak where the scriptures speak. We'll be silent where the scriptures are silent and not try to read into a scripture something we want it to say. And, of course, not take the scripture out of context. The way you know you have the right view or interpretation of Scripture is that all the Scriptures con do not contradict. They fit together like a puzzle and not taken out of context, but in their proper doctrinal and dispensational view, they fit together exactly perfect without one contradiction in the entire Bible. After studying all the views, I've got different books from different preachers and read all the different views. I've read all the different uh, things about the exception clause in Matthew not being inspired from that, uh, everything from uh, Jesus didn't mean what he said to the other uh, views that we'll mention along the study. After all of these, studying all of these views, praying and fasting for many months and days, and the Lord laid this on my heart over a year ago to do this, I've boiled the whole question down to uh, one great question on the divorce issue, and here it is. Now, you keep this question in mind as we study throughout these next few hours of tapes. Here it is. Quote, If you are divorced from someone, are you still married? Now, that sounds foolish, but that's the whole divorce issue in one giant question. If two people are divorced from each other scripturally and legally, are they still married? We, on these tapes, will take the position that divorce for fornication means the absolute cutting of the marriage bond, after which the marriage is null, void, and dead, dissolved. It is the same as if the adulterous mate had died. Now stay with us. Before you unload on us too quick, stay with us, and we'll give proof to back up these statements. We're going to study all the issues and realize that it all boils down to one great argument, and that is dissolution versus non-dissolution. Is there such a thing in the Bible as a divorce that completely dissolves the marriage and sets the people free involved in the marriage? If there is... Remarriage is not a question at all. If there isn't, then remarriage is a question. Now, we are not for broken marriages. We've never advised anyone to get a divorce. I never have, personally. I think two people that are right with God 
can work out any problem they face and overcome any obstacle by the help of the Lord Jesus Christ. However, the problem comes when one doesn't want to or will not and divorces uh, a Christian brother or a sister. What about situations like this? We are not for broken marriages. We are not trying to add to the current major problem of divorce rate up around 53% now in America, but we are for the Bible. Truth won't hurt anyone. Many preachers are scared to preach the truth about divorce and remarriage because they feel like if they allow it, then somehow or another they condone it. And of course, this is not true at all. We are for the Bible. We are for the truth. And whatever the Bible says will not hurt anyone. If someone takes advantage of that truth and abuses that truth, and that's their problem, they'll answer to God for it. But we're concerned primarily with teaching the truth of what the Bible says about divorce and remarriage. Now, still by way of introduction, there is a teaching today, especially among a lot of the Baptist preachers, that the only divorce that God Almighty ever recognized, listen carefully now, was during a betrothal period, Jews only, during the one-year engagement period that a Jewish man had with a Jewish maiden. During this time, as the Old Testament, of course, teaches, all laws of marriage applied to those that couple who were engaged, even though, though the marriage was a, uh, actually not consummated and they were not actually legally man and wife. They were called as a husband and wife, even as Joseph and Mary were in the first part of the book of Matthew. Now, the teaching today that's prevalent among so many uh, preachers, and they've uh, just kind of picked it up from each other, is that during that Jewish betrothal period, if that Jewish maid committed sexual unfaithfulness or fornication, that the husband or her fiancé was able to put her away during that one-year betrothal period. Or if he came to her on his wedding night and found out that she was not a virgin, that she had had sexual relations with another man, that he was able to put her away and send her away from him and divorce her. But once the marriage was consummated, once they were together as husband and wife, there are, was not then, nor are there any grounds for divorce and remarriage at all. Now, that's the teaching. And by the help of the Lord, we'll try to go through the scriptures and tell you how that teaching come about and the truth about the matter. We'll start out with Deuteronomy chapter 24, and we'll get to all the major scriptures concerning divorce and remarriage throughout the entire Bible. After we leave Deuteronomy 24, the Lord willing, we'll begin to move on up into the New Testament, Matthew 5.32, of course, Matthew 19.9, and then the scriptures in Mark 10, Luke chapter 16. We'll go on to Romans chapter 7 and verse 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, all those scriptures that deal with divorce and remarriage, and then finally in 1 Timothy chapter 3. So we'll cover uh, the entire study of divorce and remarriage on these tapes and reverting even back to the scriptures in Leviticus about a priest and also in Malachi uh, about divorce there and putting away. We'll start out with Deuteronomy chapter 24. Now, as you know, this scripture gives the what's called the Mosaic Law of Divorce and Remarriage. And the first thing we'll do is read this scripture to you in verse 1, Deuteronomy 24, 1. When a man hath taken a wife and married her, and it come to pass that she find no favor in his eyes, because he hath found some uncleanness in her, then let him write her a bill of divorcement, and give it in her hand, and send her out of his house. And when she is departed out of his house, she may go and be another man's wife. And if the latter husband hate her, and write her a bill of divorcement, and giveth it in her hand, and sendeth her out of his house, or if the latter husband die, which took her to be his wife, her former husband, 
which sent her away may not take her again to be his wife after that she is defiled. For that is an abomination before the Lord, and thou shalt not cause the land to sin, which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. Now, this is the divorce that the Pharisees referred to in Matthew 19 when they came to the Lord and asked him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife? They were referring back to this scripture that Moses gave them because, as you know, the scripture there in Matthew 19 had to deal with Moses allowing divorce for the hardness of heart. As you know, God himself uh, did not originally plan it this way, but allowed and permitted Moses to give this teaching to the Jewish people because of the hardness of their heart. Now, let's look at this scripture more carefully. All right? First of all, the Bible said, When a man hath taken a wife, that means, of course, that they were married, according to Deuteronomy 20 and verse 7. Now, you'll have to stop this tape every now and then and check these references. It won't take time to read them all. That they were actually married. They were not engaged. This is not a betrothal period. There's nothing in this scripture about a man and woman during a one-year engagement period and him finding out that she had committed sin. He had taken a wife and married her. So that much is clear. They are ac actually married. Um, she's not a virgin anymore. They are married. Now, if she was just his fiance. What's she doing living in his house? Down there in the bottom of verse 1, said he may send her out of his house. Now listen, a man said, uh, there's a teaching going around today that this girl, when on her wedding night, that they found out that she was uh, not a virgin, and then they go back and say that uh, the tokens of her virginity were brought, and when they found out that this girl was not a virgin, that that's what this scripture was talking about. He could write her a bill of divorcement and send her out of his house. But of course that won't work. That is not possible. And the reason you know that is not possible is because in Deuteronomy chapter 22, the Bible said that if a damsel that is a virgin, this is Deuteronomy 22, 23, if a damsel that is a virgin be betrothed unto an husband, and a man find her in the city and lie with her, then ye shall bring them both out unto the gate of the city, and ye shall stone them with stones that they die. Now listen, if that girl had committed fornication, and he found out she was not a virgin, he wouldn't have written her a bill of divorcement. They would have killed her. Two chapters before, that was capital punishment for her committing fornication during that betrothal period. So we know that it's something besides fornication. Well, what does the Bible say? Because she find no favor in his eyes, because he hath found some uncleanness in her. It didn't say adultery. It didn't say fornication. It said some uncleanness. Now, what in the world is that? Here again, I'm giving you just what the Bible said. According to the Bible, uncleanness would be a bunch of things. Leviticus 7.21 teaches that uncleanness would be the eating the flesh that was something that was supposed to be offering to the Lord. Uh, Leviticus 17.15 teaches that uncleanness would be some eating something that died of itself. Leviticus 13, 15 teaches that uncleanness would be leprosy. Leviticus 11, 36 teaches that uncleanness would be the touches, touching the carcass of an unclean animal. So there's lots of things that uncleanness, some uncleanness could be. And so Moses said, when a man hath taken a wife and married her, and it come to pass that he find some uncleanness in her, then let him write her a bill of divorcement and give it into her hand and send her out of his house. And when she is departed out of his house, she may go and be another man's wife. That is the divorce that God permitted for hardness of heart. 
Now, by the time that the Lord Jesus Christ was upon earth, this uncleanness had uh, degenerated or the, they had interpreted it so broadly that it, it became everything in the world. And that's why they, the Pharisees asked Jesus in Matthew 19, can a man put away his wife for every cause? That means just any reason he decided to. Uh, Dr. Alfred Edersheim said this, quote, included every kind of impropriety, such as going about with loose hair, spinning in the street, familiarity talking with men or flirting, ill-treating of her husband's parents in his presence, brawling, or speaking to her husband so loudly that the neighbors could hear her in the adjoining house. And they had got everything from burning the biscuits to showing her bare arms in public. And so the Pharisees come and ask Jesus, is it all right for us to put away our wife for every cause? And the Lord was dealing with this in Matthew 19 that we'll get to in just a little bit. But of course, Moses didn't say that at all. The divorce he permitted was for some un cleanness. Now let me make one point very clear and here it is. It couldn't have been that he found out she was not a virgin on their wedding night. Now it's very important you get this because many preachers are trying to uh, push this on you and they have absolutely no scripture to back up what they're saying. And I'm going to give you three main reasons why it could not have been this fella finding out she was a virgin or not a virgin on their wedding night. Number one, the scripture doesn't say anything about it being sin during the betrothal period or anything about it being finding out she was not a virgin on their wedding night. That's the main reason for rejecting that teaching. The Bible doesn't say it. And you better be real careful of believing something the Bible doesn't say. I say again, the Bible does not say that this man found out she was a vir not a virgin on his wedding night and therefore could put her away. The book doesn't say that. So if you teach that, the first thing wrong with that is you're teaching something the book doesn't say. Number two, it says some uncleanness. It does not say adultery or fornication. It says some uncleanness. Number three, the third reason for rejecting that teaching is that it couldn't have been fornication before marriage because she would have been stoned to death, not divorced and sent out to be another man's wife, Deuteronomy 22, verses 23 and 24. So if a person says it was here for premarital fornication, uh, that is private interpretation and reading something into the text that is not there. Now, I realize that a lot of uh, fellows who hear these tapes are not going to agree with that, but I, I challenge you to disprove what I just said. Now, looky here. The latter husband could just hate her and send her out of his house. It doesn't say anything about her committing adultery, fornication. It just said that first husband found some uncleanness in her. Be real careful of any man who says something the Bible doesn't say. Notice the next thing in this scripture that this divorce completely dissolved the marriage. The reason you know that is first of all it said that she may go and be another man's wife. She may go and be another man's wife. You say, well, preacher, God didn't say that. Moses said it. But in the word of God, and God allowed it for the hardness of their heart, and we know that God didn't approve of it to begin with and still doesn't want homes to break up. That's not the issue here. The issue is what does the Bible say? The Bible says she was able and may go and be another man's wife. And the Bible also teaches that divorce so completely dissolved that marriage that her first husband was no longer called her husband at all. He was not her husband. He was her former husband. So when this woman went and married this other man, she did not have two living husbands. Two living husbands is something you will not find in the Bible. 
That is a non-scriptural term that preachers have invented to push their doctrine and belief. It is not in the Bible. She, he was her former husband. Now this is the divorce that Jesus said was allowed for the hardness of their heart. It was not so from the beginning. From the beginning God made them male and female. He intended for a man to marry a woman and stay together until death. But Jesus said that Moses allowed it for the hardness of their heart. It would virtually be for every cause, as they mentioned in Matthew chapter 19. There is nothing said about this woman being immoral. He allowed the divorce for that purpose of, of some uncleanness. Now we're going to take just a moment at this point and look at this Jewish writing of divorcement. I have before me an actual copy of a writing of divorcement in, a, in, a Jewish, in the Jewish language. Uh, it's, of course, it's in English, but it's in, in their words. And I'm going to read it to you just now. Now, before I do, let me remind you of my first question. If two people are divorced, are they still married? I didn't ask you, was it God's will? I said, if two people are divorced, are they still married? married? The answer to that question in Deuteronomy 24 is no. She did not have two husbands. Her first husband was called her former husband. Now this is the le what Jesus talked about, about divorce and remarriage. He was connected with this official Jewish divorce certificate and we've seen that the Mosaic writing of divorce cut the marriage bond so completely that the woman was allowed to go and be another man's wife. Some people teach that a person is allowed to get a divorce but never get married again. There is no such teaching in the Bible. Every scripture teaching dealing with divorce, a legitimate recognized divorce, has remarriage in the context. Here in Deuteronomy 24, in Matthew 19, in 1 Corinthians 7:15. And, of course, in 1 Corinthians um, uh, chapter 7 and the 28, 7, 28, somewhere along in there with those verses. The divorcee in the Old Testament with the Jewish bill of divorcement in her hand was at liberty to enter into a new marriage. The divorce writing was her letter of freedom. It was a document of release that permitted remarriage. Now, listen. Uh, you can, you can uh, take a fit, you can stomp your feet, you can say, I don't like it, I don't agree with it, but you've got to admit that what I'm telling you is what the Bible said. You've got to admit that. And if a man will not admit what I'm saying is in the Bible, he has a prejudice in his mind or else he's scared he'll find out he's wrong and he'll, he'll make a fool out of himself if he had to admit that he'd been wrong. So you just listen real carefully. It was the same as though they had never been married. Now listen to this. The Jewish bill of divorcement in law, car law courts was an original document and it is the best evidence in a court because it helps establish the validity of facts and eliminates doubts and misinterpretation. For 14 centuries, from Moses to Jesus, this divorce bill that allowed remarriage was the only and one and only divorce of the Jews. They knew no such thing as a divorce but no remarriage in the Old Testament. Here it is, quote, On the such and such day of the week, such and such day of the, of the year, such and such year, I, who am also called son of so-and-so, in the city of so-and-so, by the river of so-and-so, do hereby consent with my own will, being under no restraint, and I do hereby release, send away, and put aside thee, my wife, so-and-so, who is also called daughter of so-and-so, who is this day in the city of such-and-such, by the river of such-and-such, -such, who have been my wife for some time past, not on their wedding night, and thus I do release thee, and send thee away, and put thee aside, that thou mayest have permission and control over thyself 
to go to be married to any man that thou mayest desire, and that no man shall hinder thee from this day forward, and thou art permitted to any man, and this shall be unto thee from me a bill of dismissal, a document of release, and a letter of freedom according to the law of Moses and Israel. That's from the Jewish bill of divorcement. That documented evidence shows us that the Bible, when it speaks of divorce and remarriage in Israel, was speaking about a marriage as dissolved by the writing of divorcement and not just dissolved by death, but a complete severance of the marriage tie. Now, to turn right around and say Jesus inter introduced a brand new kind of divorce and ab abolished all divorce is really stretching it, brother. It's really uh, taking some scripture out of context, as we'll see when we get to Matthew chapter number 19. All right, now I'm going to give you a quote from Dr. John R. Rice, who's gone home to be with the Lord now, and I'm going to quote you out of his book on Dr. Rice. Here are more questions where a person asks about uh, remarriage, and he gives them this scripture here in Deuteronomy chapter 24, and Dr. Rice says this, quote, When she is departed out of his house, she may go and be another man's wife. So divorce really means that the marriage is broken, is no more binding, and the divorced person has a right to remarry. That is the meaning of the word divorce in this scripture, and it is the same meaning everywhere else in the Bible. It means that the marriage is broken and that there is now no more binding ties. It does not mean, of course, this is my word, it doesn't mean it's God's will, but it does mean, quote Dr. Rice, the marriage is broken and there is no more binding ties that the person is single and eligible for marriage. The woman who is divorced, quote, may go and be another man's wife. As a matter of fact, the second marriage was so binding and honored by Moses and the, the, the Word of God that that woman, if that second husband ever put her away, was never allowed to go back and marry that first husband. Now that shows how strong um, the Holy Spirit had Moses to write this scripture. And by the way, the Holy Spirit did have Moses to write that scripture. Even though it was not God's plan from the beginning, God permitted it because of the people's sins, their wickedness, and hardness of heart. He allowed the divorce for that. Now, there's a teaching going around today that if a person's in their second marriage, that they can never be right with God until they leave that person and go back to their first one. According to this scripture, a person wouldn't be right with God if they did do that. They should stay in that second marriage, make the best out of it by the grace of God. It's not two wrongs don't make a right. It wouldn't be right to break up the second home and try to put the first one together. And that woman was forbidden to go back to her former husband. We had a lady come to our church one time, and she was so confused over this. Her, she was in her second marriage, and her parents had told her for years that she could not go to heaven. She could not be saved as long as she was in that second marriage until she left that husband. She had kids, she had a, had a family there, and of course you can see that was the devil trying to break up another home but because of the ignorance of her parents of the Word of God. There is one thing for sure as we uh, finish this uh, discourse on Deuteronomy 24. No person, listen carefully, no person in the Old Testament whose mate had committed immorality is commanded to remain single for the rest of their life. Let me say that again. No person in the Old Testament whose mate was guilty of immorality and who put them away and divorced them was compelled or commanded or even told to remain single the rest of their life. There is not one scripture in the Old Testament that teaches that if a man divorced his wife, especially for immorality, that that man could never remarry. Did you get that? As a matter of fact, in the Old Testament, if a man's wife went out and committed adultery and she went and shacked up with another man, 
that man sure didn't have to stay single because they killed that woman. And later on, as time goes by, uh, they begin to divorce them and put them away rather than to kill them because of the hardness of their heart. And that's what Joseph was going to do with Mary when he found out she was pregnant with child by the Holy Ghost. He was minded to put her away privily, and he was a just man. He wasn't sinning. He was a just man. And they weren't going to kill Mary. They were just going to put her away. So sometime over those few thousand years, um, divorce was began to take the place of the death penalty. And we'll see that more as we come to the New Testament. People argue that if you're divorced, you are still married in God's eyes. And you hear that a lot. Not here in this scripture. Even though God didn't institute divorce, he recognized it and said by the Holy Ghost through Moses, she could go and be another man's wife and that divorce was the same, dissolved that marriage the same as death and remarriage is absolutely clear. And you say, now, preacher, I know some great men who didn't believe that. Well, I do too. And I know some great men who don't believe that the rapture of the church comes before the tribulation. And that's not to be disrespectful to great men, but your Bible says great men are not always wise. As a matter of fact, there were very, very few preachers preached that the church would not go through the tribulation until just the last 75 years. You know what that means? It doesn't mean anything. What we're concerned with is what does the Bible say? Now, there were some great men who did take the position we've taken on these tapes. And as a matter of fact, most of the reformers did. And we'll give you some quotes from that in just a little while, if you'll stay with us. And the church was divided into two groups, Eastern and Western. And we find out that the no divorce, no remarriage teaching is a Catholic teaching that Rome taught to keep kids in the church and did not come from the Bible and we're guilty of accepting a lot of Catholic teaching in our Baptist churches before we really look at what the book said. So be real careful of teachers and preachers who try to tell you things and make dogmatic bold statements about things that the Bible says nothing about. As we wind up the study on Deuteronomy 24, remember this. Number one, they were not engaged, they were married. Number two, it wasn't a matter of fornication because the Bible didn't say it and because they killed her two chapters before that in Deuteronomy 22. And the book says some uncleanness. Also, don't forget, the divorce severed, completely cut, dissolved the marriage. She was free to go and be another man's wife. The next thing you remember is that woman was not married anymore to that former husband in the eyes of God. You say, how do you know? Because the eyes of God is the Bible. If you want to know how God looks at something, look at what he said in the book. And whatever he said in the book, that's how he looks at it. God don't say one thing in the Bible and then look at it another way. The Jewish courts recognized this divorce bill as dissolving the marriage that I read to you a moment ago. And the Lord Jesus Christ was dealing with this very same issue and subject when the Pharisees came to him in Matthew chapter number 19. In just a moment, we'll take up the study of the New Testament teaching on divorce and remarriage. Start with Matthew chapter 5 verse 32 and the long study in Matthew chapter number 19 and verse 3. Now the Lord Jesus made several sta statements on divorce and remarriage in the New Testament. They are Matthew 5:32, Matthew 19:9, in Mark chapter 10, and then Luke chapter 16 and verse 18. Now the statements in Matthew 5:32 and Matthew 19:9 are almost identical, so uh, we'll just take them two together, and then we're going to uh, answer the questions of why uh, some people feel like Jesus said one thing in one gospel and another thing in another gospel. As you know, in Matthew 5, 32, the Lord said, But I say unto you, Whosoever shall put away his wife, saving, that means except, for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery, and whosoever shall marry her that is divorced, committeth 
adultery. In Matthew 19, 9, we'll study this scripture. And then in uh, Mark chapter 10 and Luke 16, 18, there's only brief statements made by the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, many people have said, why in the world did Jesus just make such blunt, blunt bold statements in Mark chapter 10 and in Luke chapter number 16 and make such a long statement in Matthew? Of course, that's because of the question. Notice in Mark chapter 10, the Pharisees come and said, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife? Period. They just come up and said, Lord, is it all right to get a divorce? And the Lord, of course, said no. He said, if you just divorce your wife and marry another, you commit adultery. That was his answer. But the Pharisees in Matthew asked this question. Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? Notice that in Matthew, they were asking what was the grounds of divorce and remarriage. In Mark, they only asked, could a man just up and put away his wife? Now, here in Matthew chapter 19, let's study this scripture. Now, of course, you realize that when the scripture uses the word put away, that means divorce. That means, as the Old Testament said, it had the same meanings as the Old Testament, absolute severing and cutting of the marriage bond, and the people were no longer bound to each other. When two people get married, they become tied to each other. It's like a rope. That rope is threefold. It is physical. When their bodies come together, they become one flesh. It is scriptural. What God has joined together, let not man put asunder. And it is legal. You get a legal document from the state or the country you live in, uh, whatever the laws are on marriage, and you have a threefold cord binding you as husband and wife. Now, what a divorce does, it, it cuts. The word divorce means to loose. To set free, it means to cut. So a divorce actually cuts the marriage bond. Before we get into the scripture and Matthew chapter 19, we'll, we'll turn the tape over and uh, this will be uh, about as far as we'll be able to go on the first side of this first tape. We will deal with the question, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? Notice that scripture. Matthew chapter 19, verses 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. And as we get into the study on the reverse side of this tape, we'll see the Lord Jesus doing as he did many, many times. He did not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. And according to the Old Testament, came to magnify the law of God. He did not come to make things easy for people necessarily. He came to teach the truth. And the Lord answers these Pharisees on their question as they were tempting him. He answers the question on divorce and remarriage and deals with it in a way we're going to study on the other side of this tape. And I hope that you'll continue to listen on the reverse side of this tape. We'll take up the study in Matthew chapter 19 and verse number 3.